Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. I mean, this entire series has been outstanding. I've heard tremendous feedback. I heard I'm stepping into great shoes here with Rabbi Lerner and Rabbi Chaim teaching. And really, congratulations to Giselle for putting on this incredibly meaningful program, despite the difficulties of the situation and making it enriching and, and having awesome topics and allowing for us to truly study together from across the world. Um, also, extremely special shout out that I have incredible, two incredible women and play a tremendous role in my life on this phone call. I have my wife, of course, Sharona, my partner at UCLA, and then my mother from New Jersey, even though she's got the California background. It's a tremendous honor to have you with us too. Thank you so much, which is very special. This is only one of the first few times my mother's ever been able to come to one of my classes. So uh, really special silver lining in the Zoom learning. Um, really, thank you. And really thank you, Giselle, and thank you for including me in this. And thank you, everybody. I have one regret, and that is I'm about to give a class about food, and we have no food in front of us. So I brought my own, I brought my drink, and I have a whole bottle to make sure I can refill. I hope, and I know we have some people barbecuing today, right? There were some barbecuers out there. I hope that, uh, you know, I, yes, thank you so much. And, ah, oh, we got, Gil's got his cliff bar, God bless. I love to see other food. I love when people eat it. In fact, actually, I find it very settling. Like, ah, uh -uh, you got your drink, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, Giselle asked me to introduce myself, and I've been very, very honored and privileged to be working at UC Hillel for the last 17 years. And I would say this is probably one of the first five or six times that I've ever taught a class not with a lunch and learn or a dinner and learn. So it really is uh, unique for me and special. So I, I truly enjoy when people nibble or eat during my classes. It keeps it keeps it rolling. Um, but it's very, very special to be with everybody today. Um, just some other couple of fun facts. I know many of you around the Zoom, I know you. From before, for those I'm introducing myself for the first time, I've had the privilege of being here at the Hillel. And a special fun fact is my personal life is that my, all of my children are brewing, born, and bred in the most literal sense. All of my children have been born on campus, in the middle of campus. So we are truly like a, a UCLA family now all the way. And you know, we'll see what happens at the end of coming to school here. But uh, you know, they're very much part of the family. It's also, uh, go Bruins, thank you. It's also uh, incredibly phenomenal when my kids are asked what temple or what synagogue or what shul they go to, and they say Hillel. Everyone's like, wait, is that a school or is that a shul? And they say Hillel UCLA. And there is this incredible, wow, you can go to shul at Hillel UCLA. And then it's wonderful. And they're like, but we have the only kosher coffee bean. And then the smiles come out and everyone's like, wow, that is enormous so, or optimal. So it's a very, very great privilege to be a part of this, have my family be a part of this. And, you know, this year is really going to be one of the first Yom Kippur's in many, many years that I'm not physically going to be in the building leading the service, but this is just as good, if not almost as good, to be able to study a little bit of Torah together in the days leading up. So being that we can't eat together and being that we're not physically together, I did want to talk about the topic that I speak about all the time with the students or I speak over all the time is food. And Yom Kippur, for being our holiday, that is the holiday that has the least amount of food in it, right? You would think it's the finally the one time where we would not have to have this topic of conversation. There is no food. There is zero food to be had, right? In fact, we don't eat and we don't even drink. And of course, one of the major things that rabbis have to do in preparation is actually work with people who are ill, or this year, unfortunately, more people are ill than in the past and convince them to, even though it's Yom Kippur, that they should eat, because their health is more important than keeping Yom Kippur. Um, you know, not, nonetheless, I think that this following story tells it all. Um, a few days ago, my wife took my son Barak, whose birthday is tonight, and to a restaurant here in uh, the Westwood area, kosher restaurant, Bagel Factory, for those who know it, and they went online, and they were going to have like a breakfast, power breakfast between the two of them. And all of a sudden, this was days before Rosh Hashanah, all of a sudden my son here is in front of him, someone saying, when can I start ordering the bagels for break the fast for Yom Kippur? So 13 days before Yom Kippur, you know, not when are we going to do repentance or when are we going to, um, you know, save, you know, how are we going to change our lives? But when do the bagels become ready? I mean, that is, you know, that's the greatness, right? We always push the narrative of the food, no matter what it is, no matter what's happening. So I actually wanted to bring, I wanted to show you guys some interesting stories that talk about food and Yom Kippur, even though 
Yom Kippur is very much not about the food. And of course, my hope is we'll have a little fun. We'll see some interesting articles, see some fascinating discussions of commentaries. And another thing is I love when it's interactive. And I know Zoom does not lead to that same interactive. The chat box is going and I'm going to try to keep an eye on it. Giselle also will hopefully note to me. But I also would love if anybody wants to speak out. There's no turn here. You know, you can feel free to put your speaker off and, and or turn off mute and jump in. But I'd love to have a discussion also. But in the meantime, I'm going to try to share a screen. Um, Giselle, if you could just let me know if it works because I was weird. We did a practice run before it was okay, but I hope it's going to work. Let's see what happens. Are we good? Excellent. Okay. Excellent. And the only negative of sharing screen for those who have done it is, you know, you stop being able to see everybody. So again, if somebody has a question or a comment, you know, shout out. If I don't hear you, feel free to message me or Giselle. So obviously we're going to see it goes way bef before uh, 2014, but I found this article from Haaretz, which is a great, one of the great dailies in Israel, to be fascinating about Yom Kippur, about our topic. And um, it was here written by Vered Gutman. You can Google her and see what else other articles she written. But this was October 2nd, 2014, that year Yom Kippur was a little bit later. So this was before, this year this would be after Yom Kippur. And when I read this article, it really got me thinking to prepare the class. And I bolded some of the key lines and you'll see for a second, we'll start in the second paragraph. For many, Jewish holidays are about the food. And by the way, I disagree. What do you mean for many? Who is it not about the food? Have you ever met somebody who doesn't talk about the food, right? For everybody, Jewish holidays are about the food. Even the fast of Yom Kippur ends up being all about the food. But this is where it gets exciting. But when thinking about what to eat before and after the fast, it's important to keep in mind which menu will benefit and prepare your body for the undertaking without unnecessary headaches, dizziness, and starvation. So we're going to actually discuss throughout the evening, is she right? Meaning, yes, it's good not to get headaches, dizziness, and starvation. But is it possible that maybe the eating before Yom Kippur is actually supposed to make it harder, which will be a little bit of a teaser. That could actually be what the reason is. But now the next paragraph is really gets really fun. Amazingly, she set it up almost like, in that, like you know, perfect angle down of the five different traditions. So she did a little interviewing and said, what is it that people, what's the secret sauce to the food before Yom Kippur? And as she quotes, our grandmothers always know it best. Um, so jumping in, and this is, I actually, as I mentioned, I have this tremendous honor that my mother is on the call and she does this a hundred percent. She's Ashkenazi and she can attest to this. Ashkenazim chicken soup with kreplach is a classic example of food that Ashkenazim eat um, before a fast. Kreplach, for those who've never had it, are a doughy food with some type of meat or I guess there's now vegetarian options in the middle, which give you a little bit of energy to go through the day. Libyan Jews would have a similar chicken soup with egg noodles for the same meal. Yemenites, bone marrow for the main course. Bukharian Jews, ash pula, a dish of rice. And of course, Moroccan Jews make tangine of, the, of a chicken used for the ceremony of the kaparot. So you see already that each tradition, and I bet you if we went around the call, um, we'd have, I, only, I put five traditions. Can I, if anyone doesn't mind, I'm going to give a shout out to you in the call. Is there anybody here who knows of other traditions? Maybe some from the Persian tradition or other Ashkenazim, non kreplach Anyone want to jump in with something that they traditionally serve? Okay, feel free to unmute yourself. Marcia, did you want to say something? Arye, you know what I make before every fast. Here, <laughs> yeah, please. You know, what do I make? Come on. Okay, soup. I don't, Definitely a vegetable soup, I think, right? I make that for Rosh Hashanah. Mm. <laughs> Except so you for you guys. <laughs> Amazing. What do Amazing. I make before every fast? Definitely that a thick, soup. That thick pea soup with vegetables wow. and barley. That's thick pea soup. That's, that's a solid. Yes. yes, yes, the thick pea soup. Amazing. You know Thank that. You. I think you're right. No, you're right. But you got the you get the kreplach in there too. Amazing. Anybody else want to share? I we ate them on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, see, we got gotta get it later. I was gonna say it's funny that they. Or unmute me. I mean, mute me back. Yeah. Um. No, it's funny they mentioned the Moroccan tagine. My mom's not Moroccan, but that's what she makes. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Well, she okay. she always makes it for Rosh Hashanah, and then, I mean, not all these leftovers, you know. So. That's amazing. Wait, is that from like an Israel influence? Where is your mom I from? I think so, yeah. Um, I mean, 
no no part of her is Moroccan. She's like half Iraqi. Uh-huh. So maybe that I don't know. There's like a bit of Middle Eastern there, but um, but I think she just learned the recipe and and loved it. So amazing, That's like the go-to holiday thing for us. Which is part of the beauty of the in gathering of exiles. You know, that's yeah. where the coming together of Israel, like all things happen. Amazing. Thank you, Mommy. Yeah. Thank you, Gil. Anybody else want to share a food that they, that's not here that's their tradition? So I'll just share what we do at Hillel. How about that? So, the last several years, we've been running a program at Hillel um, called Feast Before the Fast, and we've actually done uh, garlic bread pasta and meatball. So that's been, as Giselle called it, we call it the carbo load or the pre sort of Yom Kippur uh, party. So that's what we got going on there. Okay, so this is a little bit of the tradition. So we see already in Haaretz that there's um, this incredible, you know, you know, article, even discussion amongst like, you know, Israelis, the five different traditions that happen. And I'm sure the truth is that if we really like pushed each other, we probably could come up with at least another several more that we have. So what about, is, is this it for Yom Kippur? So the truth is, if you turn to source two here, you already see here in some famous, uh, you know, websites. For example, I have here the spruceeats.com. They actually offer Yom Kippur pre-fast meals, and they offer you, the name for it in Hebrew is called Suda HaMaseket, and they actually give you meat menu recipes and dairy menu recipes. So, you know, sometimes traditionally we might think, oh, it's a meat meal. So apparently, according to um, the spruceeats.com, many people also offer dairy. Obviously, vegetarians will have a vegetarian option or various types of dietary needs. But interestingly enough, like it's even made into several um, cookbooks for Yom Kippur of all holidays you would think wouldn't be there. So that's like, that's like in some of like the classic things. And of course, you know, if you look as, as, I, as I go down, and if you want, anybody wants this website, I'm happy to share with you. You have a one for the crustless cheese and vegetable quiche. So it really giving you different options. And then just today, when Giselle and I were texting the other day, preparing for this, came out another article from the OU Kosher, which is one of the world's most famous kosher agencies. And they actually said, if you think that Haaretz and the websites of recipes have what to say, believe it or not, all of the ancient rabbis give their recipes also. That was amazing that this just showed up in my inbox this morning. So I added it for source three, and it's actually amazing. They actually say that the Shulchan Aruch, which is Rabbi Joseph Cairo living in the 1500s, he said that you know, he gave a lot of advice about this also. He said that you should eat light foods, right? And then, and then we, and you, some people do this in Rosh Hashanah. He even says there's a common custom to dip chal and honey again on Erev Yom Kippur, in the meal before Yom Kippur. The Mishnah Brewer, one of the commentators in the 1900s in Poland, writes that one should not overeat. It's proper to serve ch- chicken, but not red meat, right? And so everyone, and then of course, not a good time to have wine or intoxicating beverages. And then one of my interesting ones, sesame should be avoided, right? Because it causes reflux apparently. So everybody sort of has their kind of opinion on this issue. And, you know, you see, amazingly enough, it goes back Haaretz six years ago, you know, these recipe websites and even to the great rabbis of the 1500s. So this is a little bit of sort of the fun introduction but now we, you know, we're getting into it. We have about 20 minutes left. So I want to talk about what, are the, what does the tradition have to say, right? It's clear that we talk about food on all the holidays. It's clear that we, even Yom Kippur, which is the least about food holiday we have, we talk about food. It's made into the cookbooks. It's made into the rabbis. It's made it into articles and Haaretz with five traditions from different countries. But why? Why is it? And that's the question I'm trying to address today. Why is it that Yom Kippur the day where we're supposed to be the least physical, where we akin ourselves to angels. You'll see many have a custom to wear this special garment called the kittel, that white sort of angelic garment. Many have custom to refrain from many things outside of food. Even people who normally, you know, spend their day reading certain things will only read rabbinic literature. There's lots of different customs to sort of act holy. But yet, it seems that even on this day, there's these tremendous commandments to have food and it plays a central role. Why, what lesson could food possibly be teaching us going into this holy day? And that's kind of the question I wanna jump in and look at together over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So it really all begins with a discourse, like most things in Judaism, with a, two verses from the Bible. But this is where I need everybody on the call to really get out their, uh, their rabbinic think tank, their sort of their hats or their thumbs and let's get ready with us because we actually have two verses that are just five verses away from each other in the Torah, but have completely different takes 
of when should we celebrate Yom Kippur? Fascinating, right? We would think Yom Kippur would be the most obvious thing. Obviously, the holiest day of the year. It's no debate at all. Even the Torah seems to give us actually different opinions about when Yom Kippur should happen. And we'll see that there's a way out of it. But before we can get out of it, we have to see what it says. So let's begin with the first verse. And it it's, introduces us. And it's verse 20. It's Leviticus 23, verse 27. Gil, would you be willing to read it for us? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, the, in English? Or? Yeah, please, we'll do English. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how be it on the 10th day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. There shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and ye shall bring an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Okay, so the Torah tells us that on the 10th day of the seventh month, it's the day of atonement, which we refer to as Yom Kippur, and should be, right, holy day, and you shall afflict your souls. That's the, lang the technical language for what we would call the fasting and not eating. The Torah uses that language as, it doesn't say fasting explicitly, it says afflict your souls, meaning take away physical pleasures. Many of you may have heard that besides eating and drinking, we also prohibit wearing leather shoes, we prohibit marital relations, we prohibit anointing ones with oil, we prohibit taking bath. There are many things that we do in order to afflict our soul. But what's clear in this verse is the day you do it is one day a year on the 10th day of the seventh month. But five verses later, the Torah has a slightly different take. Gil, if you're doing great, if you're on a roll, if you don't mind continuing. Sure. Uh, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. From even unto even shall you keep your Sabbath. Right. So what's the problem here? So what, what's different in this verse? If you, anybody want to jump in, or Gil, you're doing a great job. If you want to share with us, what, what, what would you say is the inconsistency? Um, well, then it just said the 10th day of the month in the last verse, right? Right. And this one? This one's saying ninth day at evening. Right. Uh, so. at, e at evening. <laughs> exactly. So how do we deal with that? What day of the month is Yom Kippur? So, for example, we know in Jewish tradition, the day of the week, the day of the month begins the night before. So Sunday night begins the 10th day. We're going to go to Yom Kippur services, whether Zoom or in person or social distance, however, this year. We're going to go on Sunday night to begin Kol Nidre, and that's going to be on the 10th day of the month. But according to the second verse, you should already start on the ninth day in the afternoon. So which is it? This is not just, you know, as, as many of you have studied before, sometimes the rabbis will find a very small detail where they'll sort of hang a little something on it or expand upon it. But this is pretty explicit in the Torah. Betisha lechodesh, it says in Hebrew, ba'erev, from the ninth of the month, starting in the evening, we have to afflict ourselves. So which is it? Or is it both? So how do we deal with this contradiction? And that's sort of the beginning of, from this point on, we get, we're going to go all the way back to how we come, that there's now recipes for what we should be eating on the day before Yom Kippur to fast. So it starts with this inconsistency. Do you fast on the 10th? Do you fast on the 9th? Maybe it's both. Best part about our tradition is that we come up with a way to uh, eat instead of fasting, which we'll see shortly. Thank you so much, Gil. Um, okay. so. Where do we turn whenever we have a contradiction? The greatest place to turn whenever possible is to the Talmud, because the Talmud, that's one of their jobs. The rabbis like to teach us and expand and show us commentary for what the Bible was saying, what the lessons the Bible is teaching us. So we're now going to jump into source five in a moment. It's from Talmud Babli Masechet Brachot, the very first tractate of the Talmud, page eight. So this is an amazing contradiction. It was so important to the rabbis that the Talmud is 2,711 pages long, and on the eighth page, barely 0.002% way into it, we already said, we got to figure this out, because Yom Kippur is a big day, and we can't possibly, you know, know, what, what is it? Is it the ninth? Is it the tenth? Is it a little of both? How do we handle ourselves? How do we do it? Any interest, anyone interested in reading? Any volunteers? Okay. I can do it, Arye. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you for jumping in. Um, so it's Brachot, the Gemara Wonders, right? The, okay. Like we're all wondering. Okay, the Gemara Wonders. And does one fast on the 9th of Tishrei? Doesn't one fast on the 10th of Tishrei? As the Torah says at the beginning of that portion, however... Giselle, you're so good. You're ready for rabbinic school. I like the reading. It's tremendous. <laughs> However, on the 10th day of this seven-month, is the Day of Atonement. 
there shall be a holy convocation for you and you shall afflict your souls. Okay, guys, this, by the way, we're about to get to is awesome. This is why the rabbis rock. It seems to be there's two fast days or a long fast day. Somehow the ninth is a fast day, the 10th is a fast day. We don't know what's going on, but follow this language, follow this, this logic. You, you, Giselle, you're going to bring this home for us, the next three lines. Okay. okay. Rather, this verse comes to tell you, one who eats and drinks on the ninth day of Tishrei, in preparation for the fast the next day, the verse ascribes him credit as if he fasted on both the ninth and the tenth of Tishrei. Amazing. So just to lay this out in the most plain terms, we have a contradiction. Is Yom Kippur on the tenth day? Is Yom Kippur on the ninth day? And we solve the contradiction not by saying some pious people, you might think, fast on the ninth and the tenth, or it's, not, or it's too crazy to fast on both, so the rabbis kind of like found a leniency. No. We turn it on its head and say, if you eat on the ninth day, and then you fast on the tenth day, we give you double credit for fasting, which is amazing on three levels. A, where did they come up with that? B, even if you would say there's a commandment to eat, you should get credit for eating not credit for fasting, and C is that we get double credit. So this is an amazing package deal. You eat as much as you want on the day before Yom Kippur, then you eat on Yom Kippur, and you get 48 hours of credit uh, as if you fasted. Amazing. It's simply amazing. And, and of course, if we were doing a, a, a in-depth Talmud class, we would take great time. And I noticed many of the Many people's names here are rabbis. I'm sure you've studied this passage or you've studied the Talmud. You know, it doesn't just make stuff up. It comes up with ideas. But now, for now, we're going to accept the Talmud for what it is. But that's an amazing concept. So now is the turning point of the class for the next few minutes before we finish. It's basically, now we're saying where Yom Kippur, where you might have thought food is an afterthought or a, what choice do I have, right? I have no choice. Like, for example, in the summer, for those who, who um, practice Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the Saturday day of the Jewish year, it's practiced traditionally by many by fasting. There is an idea of eating a very sad, sad meal beforehand, an egg with some ashes. You may have heard that custom. And that's simply, that's not about nourishment. That's not a party. That's just to make you sad. Like I can't eat anything else. All I can eat is an egg and ash. It's just to put you in the framework. But And clearly the rabbis say you should eat something so the fast doesn't hurt you. But eating is an afterthought then. Here, what the Torah is, what the Talmud is telling us, the Torah is saying, is that eating is an extremely important part of the Yom Kippur service. It's not, in this, you need both. You need to eat on the ninth. Somehow, something in eating, although Yom Kippur is supposed to be the most spiritual day, something about eating is necessary to hit the heights of spirituality of Yom Kippur. So our job, and I'm not turning the page yet because I got to give you guys some homework, and I know, I know if we were in a classroom, we'd have a chance to go around the, the circle, but we're not going to do that. But I want to give everybody two minutes. It's 528 here in the West Coast. And um, we're going to give everybody two minutes till 530. And I want everyone to think, just for a second, you could write it down. You could put it in your mind. You can type it up. I'm going to bring, present to you, I'm not turning the page, three different great rabbis who try to interpret this Talmud and say, why is it that eating is essential to the Yom Kippur spirituality? But before we do that, I want to give you guys a homework for two minutes to think about your own. I'm going to put it on pause. I'm going to turn off my thing on mute. And let's take two minutes and then we'll come back together. Everyone think about what it could be, what it might mean to them to, and the importance of eating. Okay, we'll take another minute. And just to sort of add some flames to the fire here before we turn to like the commentaries, the Talmud actually in another place which I didn't bring here goes one step farther and says that even if you're someone who's so pious that you love to fast, you love fasting, you can't handle not fasting, 
there's three days a year where we force you to eat. We must eat. And you'd actually be surprised. Like, what they are is Shavuot, Purim, and, tomorrow, and this day, Sunday, Erev, Erev Yom Kippur. We force you to eat those days. Not Shabbat. Even the Seder, it seems like maybe you'd have, you could have to eat a little matzah, but you, you would be able to even technically fast on the Passover other than the matzah. But we, we force you to eat on this day. It's that critical to us that we, we force you. So amazing. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm going to present to you three answers. As you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We probably could present another three, another three, another three. And I actually wanted to have you guys, you know, everyone on the, on the call write their own answer first. Because I think even what, regardless of what the rabbis say, I think our own answer is important to us because food does play an essential role in our religion and sharing food plays an essential role and eating together plays an essential role. And there's a lot to do with food. So whatever your answer is, I think that could be relevant regardless of whether these rabbis say it or not. Okay. Amazing. Giselle, any comments come in? Anything else before we go on? Just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. See, Ravid said you should only afflict yourself for one day to avoid excess and observance. Ah, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. We'll see that uh, that sounds like one of the commentaries. Great job. Very well done. So we're going to start here with Rabbi um, And By the way, um, if anybody was interested in this piece of paper, you know, I'm happy to send it to Giselle if you want afterwards. Let me know. You could take it if you want to use it or present it. Or I also have all the Wikipedia teacher the commentaries. If you want to learn more about them, who they are and where they came from. So the very first commentary I want to look at is Rabbeinu Asher. Um, Asher ben Yechiel from the 1200s. And, um, you know, and basically it, it's very hard to find English. I found the loose English, if you will, of his commentary. It's pretty good. Um, and, you know, it's not, but again, I apologize. It's certainly not the perfect. For those who are Hebrew readers, you can look up the Hebrew at some point, then you'll see a slight, still be slight variations. But it's a loose understanding of what he says. So he's trying to work on our question. Why are we eating? And why does that count as a mitzvah? Uh, and, um, so what's going on? Okay, great. So let's jump into his commentary. So he, he says the following. The mitzvah is here to help us prepare for the fast of Yom Kippur. Even more than that, it's here to show the deep love of Hashem for the Jewish people. So he sees it like this. He sees it like how, a, how part of a relationship, especially in the parental relationship, in a certain way that God is to us, begins with nourishing and taking care of, right? As we know, when you have a baby, um, my mother's on the thing, I'm sure she can test, tell some great funny stories afterwards. You know, when you have children, it's not so simple for you. They have a lot of things you gotta deal with them, right? So you gotta take care of them, you gotta clean them, you gotta bathe them, you gotta deal with like in public when, they, uh, when, when their stomachs erupt. You know, lots of funny things happen over the time. And a, one of the ways that we show our love is that we just do and do and do and do for our children, grandchildren, because we love them, even if it's frustrating, even if it's annoying, even if it's, if it's bothersome, in order to begin the relationship from a loving place. And then as they get older, then they feel the love and then we can develop a, depth, a deeper part of our relationship. So he's arguing here basically that this is showing the deep love of Hashem for his people. He says that Hashem views us as his children and that Yom Kippur, he needs to do it for us. It's kind of, if you will, hopefully this year should be the year of the vaccine, right? If you will, this, you know, when you take your kid to get a shot or you get your kid to do a vaccine in a modern version, we'll see what he says. You don't just take them, especially if they're a Yale kid and you read them, a, a, I don't know, a story about bears going to like the doctor, right? And you, and then afterwards you give them chocolate or you, you take the doctor wears a funny mask or you do things that you try to build that the environment of the shot even though it's good for them, but it's going to be hurt, painful, that the environment is a loving, loving environment. And that's what Rabbeinu Usher is arguing. This is, and he says, this is similar, and he gave this example, it's kind of a famous example, this is similar to a very great king who has a beloved child who he commands to fast once a year, and he commands him because he wants to teach him discipline. But the day before the fast, he insists that the servants prepare for him a glorious, and I put this in, optimal feast. Right? So too, Hashem demands that we eat before Yom Kippur, it's not that, as I said, it's not that it's an option or it's a good idea. He demands so that the fast goes very easy. His love for us is so great that if we eat on the ninth and the fast on the 10th, he gives us credit if we fast at both. So he's doing, he's, he's loving us, he's caring, and he's saying, I want, and I want you to 
afflict your souls, but I, and I want to give you double credit. I want you to get credit as it, but nobody can fast two days in a row, or it's very difficult to do something like that. So I'm going to make it super easy. I'm going to let you eat and then fast so that eating and fasting double down is fasting. A lesson from this, of course, each person should take their own lesson from this commentary, I think is saying, is that as we go into Yom Kippur, and it's a very difficult day, obviously, practically difficult, emotionally can be difficult. If we're doing the work that we need for Yom Kippur, it's very hard to reflect on a year, let alone on a lifetime of activities, or certainly if there are things that we're not proud of, it's very hard to reflect. But we have to know that it's a safe space. And Rabbeinu Usher is arguing that telling us that Yom Kippur is a safe space. It's a difficult space, it's a hard space to be on, but it's a safe space with Hashem where the relationship is loving. And that's when we're eating the food on Sunday and preparing for the fast, from his perspective, we shouldn't be seeing it as, oh, practically, let me take a caffeine pill now. Let me take like, uh, you know, five Powerades now. So I'm not, I'm, dehi- I'm not dehydrated the next day. We should say it as, I'm taking this now because the master of the world who I'm going to talk to on Yom Kippur, I'm going to relate with, loves me and wants me to be open. So he wants me to be able to be focused, very similar to what we would say in the modern parlance, a safe space, what we at Hillel try to make for our students, what we at Hillel try to do in our rabbinic you know, discussions, that it's not just about do this or do that. It's about, this is a safe space to talk, and it's a loving space. And that's, in a sense, what Hashem is trying to do, according to Ben Asher, by making us eat. So he gives us the credit as if we fasted twice, but he wants us to eat so we feel the love going into Yom Kippur. That's approach number one. Approach number two is all the way on the other side and says the following. What's the goal of Yom Kippur? It, it's been a full year and mistakes have happened and you got to grind it out. And sometimes, you know, you made mistakes that it's not easy to make that phone call that's difficult. It's not easy to uh, make, you know, to admit that you did something wrong. And it's not easy, you know, like for example, right now, personally, just to share, I'm starting with my daughter's to try to train for a 5k certainly is not easy for me those first days you know she's running ahead of me and huffing and puffing and and and, you know you you have to grind it out sometimes life is about grinding it out and says the torah to mima which you know again if i'm happy to send the document if you want to learn more about him he quotes the idea the idea of the mitzvah to eat on the ninth and tishrei is to help us attain more affliction it's actually to make it more difficult because we have a well-established principle that says after a large feast it's very hard to fast the next day Right, like you go to a wedding, you feel like, oh, you know, partied all night. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna, quote unquote, be I, I, glad to have a fast day. Not really. Once you get used to eating so much, and a modern example I add, this would be caffeine withdrawal, right? In other words, we know this that people who drink coffee every day, a lot of times starting tomorrow, and they go from two cups to one cup, or five cups to four cups, three cups, two cups, one cup, with the hope that on Yom Kippur, it will be easy. So he actually says it's to afflict us. Amazing, because you eat. And that's why he says you get, you get the value of the mitzvah of double affliction because it, by eating, it makes Yom Kippur harder. So what lesson should we learn from that? Again, everyone should have their own lesson from this. But I would argue is that it's just there to tell us that there's hard work. In other words, it's, it is a 48-hour experience. In, in other words, 24 hours just might not be enough. If you're going to reflect on a whole year, 24 hours isn't enough. So what the Torah team is telling us is that understand this eating is practically good. Yes, you'll enjoy the food. Yes, it will help you a little bit, but it's also going to make it harder. And invest on Sunday, not just starting on Monday. Invest starting on Sunday in the process of allowing yourself to come to terms with what you've done great, by the way. You must, must come to terms with what you've done great this year because you've done great things. You cannot allow that to go by. At the same time, you have to come to terms with the fact that it's, it isn't just a walk in the park. Almost exactly opposite of Rabbeinu Asher. Rabbeinu Asher says, loves us. Hashem makes it easy. He wants to give us big credit. He loves, he, come in loving. He's saying, no, come in a little bit scared. And by the way, these are the two concepts of what we refer to in the Torah as Yirat Hashem and Ahavat Hashem, love of God and fear of God, right? It's, those are the two concepts. So the first one represents the Ahavat Hashem, that Hashem makes it easy and simple and he loves us and he wants us to come in with a loving attitude. And the second one is saying, understand God, your time this year was a gift. And this year we know that very well. We know how well the gift is. We understand that it was a gift this year and take it seriously that this gift should be used properly. So that's how he understands this midst of eating. It's to prep us that it's a 48 hour experience. God can't make us fast for 40 hours. We wouldn't function. We would be too difficult to be good at it. 
But if you're eating the first day and you're fasting the second day, the fasting's harder, but you can function because you have the calories flowing to your brain. So use the time to, to really go deep. But all this is wonderful. But I, at least from my perspective, save, because I wrote the class, say what I think is the best for last. And I think that to me, when I studied this position in preparation for the, this, this talk, it changed my understanding of what really what's happening here. And this is from the Sfas Emes. And he was one of the great Hasidic masters. And again, I have the Wikipedia. If you want to learn more about him, you can Google him. So he, he says like this. He says that he's not saying rejecting. Nobody rejects everybody completely. He's saying the other ones are, are fine. They're true. But we're missing out the most important thing of Yom Kippur. We often focus on Yom Kippur on the day itself, appropriately, on the relationship with God. And, you know, whoever happens to be in our row with us. But what's something you can't do on Yom Kippur? You often can't, or especially this year, we really can't ever, but you can't just be around all the people you're around all the time, right? Norm normally on the days leading up to Yom Kippur, you're at your office, you're in the market, you're with your family, you're with, in, in this year, you're on Zoom with all the people, you're on Zoom with your friends, you're on Zoom with your board of directors. And guess who are the people you probably most likely need to have a reckoning with about the past year, the people you're closest with. The person you cut off in November and you cut them off and you said to them, go fly a kite, they probably don't even remember you. You don't remember them. But it's the person that in December you needled each other in the office meeting, then in February, then in March, you know, you would make fun of, oh, their background looks terrible on Zoom, right? Then in, you know, in June, you know, you'd be like, I, I, I feel like you're taking too many vacation days, whatever, right? We, we understand you have relationships where you, you push people's buttons. So the Sfas Emma says, why is there a mitzvah to eat on the ninth day? He quotes, and I'll read the following. He says, there's a great mitzvah to ask forgiveness and give forgiveness leading up to Yom Kippur. It's a great mitzvah. This is the work. I'm sorry, I guess when the translation is a misprint. We have the concept, and he's quoting from the Talmud, that when someone is hungry, they have a hard time concentrating. They can't, when someone's hungry, as you may have heard, aka they may be grouchy, or some people may use the word, I've heard people use the word hangry, or things like that. When somebody's hungry, they are not in a position to be forgiven. They are not in a position to ask for forgiveness. They are not in a position to pick up the phone call and make the pick up the phone, pick up the Zoom, pick up the whatever WhatsApp, and make the difficult phone calls, difficult text messages, difficult messages. They're not in that position. So he actually says that we, everything up till now missed an important piece. The ninth day, it's a mitzvah to eat and eat all those good foods. So you are in an incredibly good mood. Have the caffeine, have the whatever your thing, the dessert, whatever your thing is. But remember we saw earlier, not wine. Because what's wine, although a little bit can help you loosen up sometimes, too much could knock you out of this possibility, right? Have all the good foods that make you happy, that make you easygoing, that open up your mind, that allow for you to make the difficult phone calls. And then he says, if you have those difficult conversations on the day before Yom Kippur, minimally, if you're in a good mood and don't take anybody off, maximally, if you have the difficult conversations and you don't bother anybody and you don't hurt anyone's feelings and you call people and you make up, and then you go into Yom Kippur, you've fulfilled the two other mitzvahs of the Torah. One is Ben Adam L'chaveru, the mitzvah between man and man. Ben Adam Lamakum between man and God on Yom Kippur. And then you can, you're a very whole person who can have the most important relationship between yourself and yourself. Because ultimately, we are by ourselves, we, as much as we're a part of a community, part of the family, we live in our own minds. We have, we have to be comfortable with ourselves. We have to be proud of ourselves. And somebody who can say, I did the work of the ninth and I did the work of the tenth, that's a person who's rewarded for two days of hard work and comes out of Yom Kippur with absolute happiness and ready for a new year. And, you know, I think they're all important issues. I think, you know, just to recap briefly, again, we saw, you know, it goes back, there's recipes for every keyboard, there's strategies, all the rabbis at different times give their opinion. It's, and whether it's there to teach us the love of God, whether it's there to teach us the fear of God. But I think that if you got, the message I would hope everyone leaves with from this is that this teaches us that the ninth day is even maybe perhaps more important. And that's why the Torah said, the Torah wasn't being tricky by saying the ninth and the 10th. Torah is telling us, you want the 10th to be successful? 
it has to be the day of the ninth where you eat and you're happy and you're engaging and you're warm and you're friendly and you're amicable and you can work things out with people. Then you can come to the tent and then I'll give you double credit. And that to me is the work of, you know, of that. And then, and that's why one of the goals, that's why the break the fast, and then if you think about what's the, the break the fast, where often we have even greater groups that come together for a break the fast than a pre the fast, is because now we've done the work. We've come together, we've brought their relationship, and we can celebrate. So it's 5.45, I promise in my, uh, in my advertisement, 5 to 5.45, I hate being uh, late. I hate stop going overtime. So I will stop here. Um, I really thank you for listening. Thank you for having me a part of this incredible uh, program. And if anybody has any comments or questions before we go, I'm happy to take a couple more minutes. But otherwise, um, I'll be here. And also, if Giselle, if anybody wants my sheets, I'm happy to share them. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rabbi Arie. This was truly enlightening. And I can't believe I never learned this before. Um, feel Thank so you. Thank about carbo loading. <laughs> Well, and by the way, just as a shout out to our Hello, for those, I know many people on this call are Hello supporters behind our, our work. We've come up with a way to provide students with food as a feast before the fast drive through. So we are making it happen for everybody, even though it's not the regular, it's going to be happening anyway. So, so you know, you can all sign up to come to our uh, drive through Carvalho. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. And thank you, Mommy. Thank you for joining.